Next, we'll hear from New York Times bestselling author and CNN host and senior legal analyst, Laura Coates. Today, we'll explore her experience where she quickly found that the pursuit of justice creates injustice. But first, I'm going to turn it over to Carlton Moore, director of the Bureau of Justice Assistance at the U.S. Department of Justice, who will be introducing and interviewing Laura. Carlton was appointed by President Biden to the Bureau of Justice Assistance in February of 2022. Prior to joining the Bureau, Carlton served as the executive director of Ohio's Office of Criminal Justice Services. He also served as the facilitator for former Ohio Governor John Kasich's task force on community police relations, a precursor of the Ohio Collaborative Community Police Advisory Board. Please join me in welcoming Carlton and Laura. I'm proud and honored to have the opportunity to meet and interview Laura Coates, who I have followed and certainly watched on CNN. Let me first tell you a bit about Laura. She practiced law in Minnesota and New York, handling cases ranging from intellectual property litigation and First Amendment issues to defamation and media law. She served as a trial attorney in the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice during the Bush and Obama administrations, specializing in the enforcement of voting rights throughout the country. She also served as an assistant United States attorney for the District of Columbia, prosecuting a myriad of violent felony offenses, including drug trafficking, armed offenses, domestic violence, child abuse, and sexual assault. Her experience in that role served as the basis for the content of her book, Just Pursuit a black prosecutor's fight for fairness. Welcome, Laura. It's great to be here with you today. Thank you. I'm really thrilled to be here, Carlton. I'm so glad and honored to be invited to from the Ohio State Bar Foundation. So thank you so much for extending it, and I'm eager for the conversation. Great. I, let me just first say how much I enjoyed your book. I think it raised a number of incredibly important issues. And so let's uh, spend some time talking about those. Your book notes that the pursuit of justice creates injustice. Can you explain to our listeners exactly what you meant by that? Well, thank you for reading it. And it's really a very deeply personal and I felt very vulnerable even writing it because so often in the work that I do, I'm analyzing and I'm synthesizing and I'm explaining the law, but I'm not always telling you how I feel about it or what is going through my mind in those moments. And so when you think so often about how frequently you hear people talk about speaking truth to power, I think they first ought to know what the truth really is. And when we ask for justice, what that really looks like and at some instances, how the sausage is made. And one of the things that I found true, which was frankly surprising to me when I joined the Department of Justice, and I don't consider myself to be a naive person by any stretch, but I think I was naive to the fact that when you pursue justice, you're going to have collateral impact and at times damage. And at times in that pursuit of the end, meaning how we think traditionally about what justice looks like, we think about it in terms of a courtroom decision, a verdict of some kind, a sentence that is actually served. In reality, there are, because of the systemic deficiencies in our justice system, um, we sometimes create circumstances where there is a full display of inequity imbalances. And we think about that in many respects when you realize that the Department of Justice, they don't have private clients. I started in private practice, but it's on behalf of the people of the United States. Um, and so when your goal is towards preventing a future victim, you have a different mindset as if it were trying to simply make whole an individual person. And in doing so, you create some systems where equality might not be on the mind. You mentioned systemic deficiencies. Can you just talk a little bit more about that? You know, when I would stand up and I would say Laura Coates on behalf of the people of the United States, um, that didn't just mean the people who might be victimized or the person that was. It also included the defendant. It included the person who has a presumption of innocence. And we know full well that although we have this refrain of a presumption of innocence, we also know that 
money does make the world go round and has an impact and influence on our justice system as well. Really, it's a legal system in pursuit of justice more than it's simply a justice system. And so you have to sometimes pay for that presumption of innocence in the form of being able to retain the necessary counsel that could be at any in any way able to go toe to toe with the overwhelming span of resources for the Department of Justice. Um, and so you've got this systemic notion about whether you can afford to either make bail or to be out while you're trying to mount your defense or to retain the counsel that has the skill and the focus and the bandwidth resource wise to be able to defend you. That's part of it. Another issue is that many of our, um, we think about our, our laws, it's about the enforcement of them and how we prioritize certain communities and certain types of crimes. We know from the war on drugs very well, which is an ironic notion now, given that one of the people who was so impactful in forming the laws surrounding how we think of drug sentencing has now had a bit of a change of tune and is now the president and head of the executive branch of government, realizing the evolution of thought. But just the way in which we have prioritized traditionally our crimes and drug crimes in this country, particularly, and what we think of as a um, who a criminal is, informs how juries will look at different cases. It informs how judges will look at cases. Bias is so baked into the recipe, unfortunately, of, of how we consider crime and justice in this country that it creates systemic deficiencies that need to really be resolved. You mentioned a couple things there. Um, first, you talked about bias and certainly the way the law is applied. So can you talk a little bit about how laws that may seem on their face, unbiased and perfectly fair as written, can actually um, promote racial inequities? You know, it's really about the application of the law. It's kind of like thinking about one's own resume, you know, who you are on paper is one thing. What you do with that paper, quite a different story. And so the idea of what's on paper is the law itself. And we think about it written in, you know, the same black ink as every other piece of legislation or every other criminal statute in this country. But the way it's applied is through the mechanism of prosecutorial discretion. It's applied through the lens of police officers who have directives about what to police and whom to police. And it's viewed through the lens of jurors who have their own built-in bias based in part on stereotypes, also in part a little bit, Carlton, about their views of law and order. And I mean the show, not just the phrase, but how you think cases are resolved in a 45 minute window, complete with DNA. There's always eyewitnesses. There's always going to be, you know, a big Perry Mason moment at the end in some refract for flame. So you have these different competing notions about it. And so it's not so much what is written in the words as much as how it's interpreted. And I'll give you an example. Um, we think about a, um, a Supreme Court case as opposed to just the laws themselves, about how you interpret um, reasonable force or excessive force and what a reasonable standard of behavior would be for a police officer. Now, there's many cases in this space, but you are normally, because of Supreme Court law, expected to judge the behavior of a police officer through the lens of a, another officer similarly situated, the reasonable officer standard, not the reasonable person standard, you and I or anyone else, I mean, we're both reasonable, and I think we are, but the reasonable officer in those scenarios. So on its face, you'd say, okay, well, what's wrong with that? You want somebody who is going to know the footprints and the path that is taken, and you're going to judge that way. They have the wherewithal, they have the experience, but you're also also asking the lion to judge his own kill. You're asking them to judge the hunt themselves. And there's all sorts of built-in loyalties that impact the ability of the reasonably situated officer to judge objectively. And so in the application of even how we prosecute cases under that standard, we, we almost build in the perpetuation of a selective bias and enforcement. And so it's really not so much the way a law is written, but the way it's enforced, the way that it is chosen to be prosecuted, and the way it is ultimately judged 
by the judicial branch in re- even reviewing these cases. You know, in your book, you talked about your sense of questioning your allegiance to the system or to your community. And so can you, can you talk a little bit about that? You know, there were so many moments and I, I almost had the reverse career path that so many people have. You know, normally you're starting out in the government and you're going towards the golden pastures and they say the golden handcuffs <laughs> and that's how you sort of rotate. I took the reverse. Um, it says a lot, really, I'm, I'm not particularly driven by money. I'm driven by the interest that I have. And so I wanted to have the experiences. I wanted to be in trial. I was really wanting to have my vision of what it was to be a lawyer really align with the reality of what I was doing day to day. Perhaps there is a naivete about that. Um, But when I think about the allegiances, when I went to the Justice Department from, I was in the Civil Rights Division and then moved on to be an AUSA in Washington, DC for more courtroom experience. um, I had come from the voting section which truth be told, I had always revered. I have all, I was somebody who grew up, you know, my mother is from the South, North Carolina, moving North only when her parents, who were both domestic employees, sent for her to move up to Stanford, Connecticut when they were working for some of the, you know, biggest business moguls that we all know. I would later represent some of those business entities in private practice. My father growing up in Worcester, Massachusetts, a foster child for most of his life, um, aging out of the system before they met in college, respectively Emerson Smith. And the stories that I was always told in my home and the, the heroes that we thought of were always those who were the civil rights legal architects those who saw the problems, identified them, was able to use the system and the rules in their favor and inert the benefit of people who looked like them and those that did not, but reflected their values nonetheless. So for me, going to the Civil Rights Division was something that I was extraordinarily honored to even have the chance to do. And the voting section in particular, at a time before Section 5 had been gutted, the before Section 2 had been diluted, um, before, you know, there was a, there were laws created in search of a problem related to fraud and the era that we now live in. The idea of going around the country and enforcing voting rights, I was received and regarded precisely different than I was as a prosecutor, same title, but now in a courtroom prosecuting violent crimes. On the one hand, in the Civil Rights Division, you were viewed as an ally, an extension of the people who wanted to have justice, opportunity, and equality. In the courtroom, when it came to prosecuting violent crimes, although the title was the same, I was regarded as the man. Now, I had not been regarded as the man before, and I don't know that I've been regarded as the man since, but okay, this is what the man looks like, so be it. And it was viewed in many ways as, well, hold on, you are part of the prosecutor's office, which to some necessarily meant I was an enemy of civil rights. I was an enemy of the people, and that I was just singularly focused on notches on a belt to improve my prosecution record. Now, I thought that was really difficult for me personally to try to reconcile because, Carlton, it can't possibly make sense to people that you can either be a proponent of civil rights or a prosecutor. Don't the people who are the victims of violent crimes, don't they also deserve an advocate and a champion? No one likes to be victimized. No one wants to be victimized. Nobody would say, at least in public spaces, that they would like to have anyone be soft on crime. But the expectation for a Black woman in that position was essentially to say that you had to be a defense counsel to even prove that you believed in civil rights. And I just felt that um, knowing what I learned through and perhaps instinctively knew about the legal system, you got to be in a position that's not simply reactive. You have to actually, if you are a decision maker, you must bring yourself through those decisions. You must use the experiences you have, your knowledge of the world around you. And of course, your staunch advocacy for civil rights, because as I said at the beginning, I also represented then the defendant and I had to be able to question an officer. I had to be able to question with skepticism, a healthy level of it, how they were able to smell drugs 
inside of a person's body as they walked by across the street? Or was it something about a racial animus that was going on? Was there um, racial profiling happening? Was there, the, was the constitution being honored in different ways? And as using your discretion, you had to be the person to make a ton of decisions before it even got to the defense counsel's hands. And so this is a long way of saying when I think about that battle of allegiance, it was something that I, um, as I got more involved in the system itself and realized what that level of discretion really felt like and the weight of it, there's a tension between pursuing the law blindly and understanding more broadly the impact of your decisions. And I was, you know, all called all sorts of names in the courtroom by people. Um, uh, you know, people wondered, how could I really believe in civil rights and yet be a prosecutor? And I have resolved, um, and through a tremendous amount of reflection I talk about in the book as well, that if you're going to have a seat at the table, it's what you do in that position not necessarily which side you're on. So there are a number of, of themes that you really hit on there um, that I think back to the book. And one is um, people who had been victimized, who, you know, the chapter on not, my, not their son too, you know, this family who had gone through this terrible ordeal, yet they had empathy for the other family, the, the woman, the elderly woman whose car was stolen. And um, she said, you know, you're acting dumb, just like my son did when, when he was a 20 year old. So, you know, it, it strikes me that it's so interesting that people who have seemingly experienced so much and gone through so much, still have this level of empathy and compassion. And yet you have the opposite from the judge who judges the rape victim or uh, the judge who doesn't believe in the mistaken identity of the person standing in front of her. So where does that come from? Both the empathy and the lack of empathy. You know, it's one of those testaments, perhaps, to the human spirit that people can still feel compassion. Um, and I think for so many, we expect the Hammurabi's code version of an eye for an eye in every instance. And in reality, people are far more intellectual and compassionate about the system that they find themselves in. Um, when you talk about the instances and in some of you named, the idea that you'd have families whose own children had been murdered, not wanting to see a life go away through life in prison for those who have committed that crime, it does speak to the idea of the wherewithal about one, what it's like to seek an exact vengeance, what you really want from that, and what justice looks like as opposed to giving people a second opportunity. And I'm not going to suggest that everyone said, oh, no, you know what? Um, you know, everyone was not a Mother Teresa who were the families of loved ones who were impacted. That certainly was not the case. But there were moments when you would see people realizing that the weight of the system and the punishment that would follow through our discussion and decision of what justice looks like was not always in line with what the individual victim or their families viewed as just. And it speaks to the fact that we really, in this formulaic system, and we've got criminal codes and statutes and set, set, uh, sentencing guidelines and the like that tell us, okay, if this, then why? You know, if X, then why? Hope that was right. It's been a long time since I've done math, <laughs> and my kids are in third and fourth grade, so we're not doing the transitive property, I don't think yet. But if the, you know this, then that, but it doesn't always fit into that formula. Um, but it's not always, sadly, the opportunity for those who are on whom we serve for we and get justice for have any real voice in the system, right? The idea of, you know, you see on law and order and different shows, clearly I've been watching the marathons as I keep mentioning the shows, <laughs> but the reason you hear about that and someone will say, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't want to press charges. And in the world of Hollywood, the prosecutors go, Oh, all right. Well then they don't want to press charges. I guess our work here is done. 
In reality, most of the time, a prosecutor doesn't even need to ask you your opinion of what you want to happen, because again, you're not the private client. It's on behalf of the people who are collectively offended by the behavior and the real conversations with the person who has been victimized is about what type of witness they will be, cooperative or otherwise, whether they will be able to be corroborated, whether they can be impeached, all sorts of instances like that. And so the idea, it's you look at the system and think the fact that there is still empathy and compassion where people are often voiceless is something that's very surprising. Um, and the same refrain, though, you know, there's a great deal of power in deciding one's fate that not everyone even wants to have. Some are driven by it or motivated by it, and they find it very intoxicating. A judge at times can feel be intoxicated by the idea of righting a wrong. A law, a, a police officer, intoxicated by righting a wrong. A prosecutor, a defense counsel, you name it. But if we don't actually think about and include in the conversations what justice looks like to the individual person, we are falling short in many, many ways. I, I don't yet know how to resolve it, though, because we live in a society where we don't have, unfortunately, the time and luxury to stop and contemplate every individual need that can be, you know, cyclical in their emotions toward an event. We have to sort of govern and prosecute as if, you know, there is one standard and one reasonable standard of how people will feel about an issue. But there is room, Carlton, to change the way the law contemplates victims and the way in which we assign a punishment to crimes. So I, too, have been caught up in the um, law and order uh, marathons recently. <laughs> Uh, it's, uh, I hate when it comes on the beginning of the show and you see the crime occur. And I know at that moment I'm sucked in and I'm going to be watching you know it. until the, it's the dunk done. It's that, that's it. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. You hear those notes and it's on, right? So I think, you know, that you've really identified an ongoing tension in the law that we're experiencing right now. And that is, um, seemingly on one end. Everyone goes to jail. On the other end, no one goes to jail. And we're kind of back and forth trying to figure out how do we do exactly what you're talking about? And that is justice for victims while justice for defendants as well. So are there ways that the legal system itself needs to evolve so it better delivers justice to both victims and the accused? You know, one of the things to, to think about um, in evaluating how we can do better is, one, just to cr confront the very real reality that I know everyone in the Ohio State Bar Foundation certainly understands that we practice law. I mean, the verb is practice, not perfect. We practice the law. And just as doctors are practicing medicine, and there will be moments that we get it wrong. There'll be every single second of the day when you are expected to be perfect and there will be no time to be perfect. Just look at the what's happening on Capitol Hill and the ideas of a budget battle continually looming and the idea of resources and the appropriation of resources and different things. There's always a closed or fixed unit, a finite amount of resources. And within that finite ball of resources, we are supposed to do every and anything and perfectly, all the while practicing. Um, and there are humans who are actually practicing. So you have to, hu to, err is to, human to err is human, and you've got the idea of all the things that we come with, our baggage that is actually on display at times. And so accepting the reality of that there are going to be a finite amount of resources, it does mean that we have to prioritize the types of crimes that we want to devote the finite amount of resources to which means we have to get away from the idea that although every there are, people can commit a crime and everything and laws can be broken, do you have the resources to put towards it, which means you're taking away from something else. You see this a lot in um, the so-called progressive prosecutor-based jurisdictions where they're talking about prioritizing violent crimes over so-called victimless crimes or um, 
a nominal amount of marijuana that someone has in their possession for personal use, sometimes prostitution-based crimes, a lot of things that people traditionally say, you know, this is all part of, you know, Pandora's box. But we as a society have made decisions about how we want to give resources and what we want to do with the money. And we've steered away from those types of crimes overwhelmingly. Um, that's number one. Number two, I think when you're when you're talking about how we um, can confront some of the deficiencies in the system. I know that we are in an era where people um, attribute every recognition of race and its impact in our society, and they dismiss it as woke. And that's supposed to be pejoratively used to describe that people have um, thin skin, that they will play a race card whenever they can, unjustifiably, and that they're trying to change the system and make the world unrecognizable. That's the talking points against so-called wokeness. But in reality, race does have a significant impact on our criminal justice system. It has ever since the so-called pig laws of the South following the 13th Amendment and beyond. It has ever since we've just prioritized and through racial profiling types of crimes, ever since the discussions about broken windows and the conversations around um, who, whose lives matter in the eyes of those in uniforms that are blue. Uh, race does have an impact. And I think we have to be cognizant of the fact that it is impactful either implicitly or explicitly, but it has, unfortunately, a role. It is the elephant in the room. It is the elephant that's peeling down the, um, the blindfold of Lady Justice. And that third point, I've always had a problem. This sounds odd to people, but I've always had a problem with that mascot. I don't like Lady Justice. I have nothing against her personally. <laughs> I don't know her. But I don't happen to like this philosophy that justice is supposed to be blind in the sense that we don't see the impact of race or gender or the race of the victim and the race of the accused or the clothing that someone is wearing or the criminal record that somebody has um, or any in, um, or the money that a person has and all those things that we see with our eyes that we know you know is part of having a jury of your peers that they see you and they feel seen, that we continue to think that if, as long as we're blind to all the things that impact every other facet of our society, somehow everything will balance in the end. And I think we have to be truthful about what we really see more than trying to be philosophical and pretend that, oh no, I, it never, you know, it never occurred to me that aspect of it. When every single juror and judge and prosecutor and cop and defense attorney sees what we're all talking about. I think sometimes it's just the big reality check to really get towards a justice system. So why is it so hard? I mean, why is it so hard for so many to look at, I mean, we track everything now by stats. You know, we can give you stats for everything. I can tell you right now the type of um, peremptory challenges that are gonna be made in juror cases. Um, so why is it so hard and what are we so afraid of to recognize the role that race plays in the justice system? When we know the justice system is made up of people, it's not a special group of people who end up there, but it's made up of, of people. We all have biases. We all have these, um, we're all dealing with these challenges. So why is it so hard for people to accept that? Well, as I told my little girl today, I'm special and I think you're special too. <laughs> so maybe that's part of it. But, you know, um, I think it's because I think people believe, and I'm going to take away from the sort of the political idea of blaming and that if you mention race, then you are condemning an entire race of contemporary peers as opposed to reflecting on history. I'll put that aside for a moment. I think it's because if people believe that race is a factor, that it will be perceived as the only one. And there are other factors that go into the inequities in our system. A lot of them revolve around and are parallel perhaps to 
demographic information. But I think people believe if you accept the fact that race is a factor, that people will only focus on that and it couldn't possibly be anything else. Um, and I think that might be maybe at its core, I'm being generous, but a, a grave concern for people. Because if if someone were to say, okay, well, the whole issue is race. It's only ever race. It's only ever going to be race. Well, what can't we change but for trying to convince people that race does not exist, right? I feel like I'm that the little kid in the Matrix trying to explain to Keanu Reeves' character, Neo, that there actually is no spoon. That's why he can't bend it. I know I'm going deep here on the Matrix. That's what I'm saying. I like the movie. Um, but the idea, you're not going to convince people race does not exist. I mean, really, and not, I, not really in my lifetime, I doubt it, Like, let alone my kids' time, I bet. There's a lot of um, pride associated with people's um, identification in their races, racial groups as well. So I don't think you're going to have that. So um, I think people have to realize saying that race is a factor does not mean it's the only, if we can't change it, then you can't solve the problem. If you can't change the fact that race exists, I know philosophers around are cringing. If you can't change the fact that people believe that race exists, then you'll have no solution to the problems in justice system. But think about the different factors that um, contribute to how we think about racial disparities. It's things about socioeconomic issues as well. It's about where people are living. It's about um, about economic opportunities that are in particular areas. It's about the way congressional districts are drawn to look more like a salamander or a Goofy's hat than it is to look like a shape that your children can recognize. Although I'm told this is no longer a square, it's now a rhombus, and I'm not <laughs> cool for saying that. So whatever, new math. Um, but that's, I think, what, what has to be a part of the conversation that, yeah, race is a factor. But so is money. So is geography. So are rep so is representation and who are the people that decide what laws to try to create and implement. So are those in positions of power. So are the priorities of an area. So is the economy. So is the labor market. So is our views about imports and exports. Conversations around a whole host of things. So um, if we just get people to think, like I, I said it's a factor. It needs to be addressed, but it wouldn't be the end of the story. Well, I'm going to give you kudos for uh, making a Matrix analogy. That is a <laughs> that is an incredible movie. And not only um, is there an issue about whether or not he bends the spoons, but remember when he walks into the room and knocks over, I think there are biscuits or cookies or something sitting there, and she tells mm -hmm. him it's no big deal. Yeah. So yeah. if you if you've See? seen it, you've seen it, right? <laughs> so you talk about these bears. So, you know, what are some things that uh, justice professionals can do to begin eliminating these barriers? You know, one of the things is we we spend a lot of time thinking about the so-called pipeline, which I think is I've heard it now it's a taboo statement to make about the so-called pipeline. We talk a lot about the people of getting diversity and inclusion and wanting to have visible diversity and also wanting to have people who are having a seat at the table being there. And the old Shirley Chisholm reference of if they don't have a seat, bring your own chair. But we never seem to get past that particular quote. It's not just that you have to be at the table. You can't be mute when you're at it. You cannot believe that you should leave yourself in the door frame and just come in with, you know, this malleable, I've never been involved, I've never seen a thing, the pure sort of blind idea of no identity. You can't be that person when you're there. I have found it is always best to enter any room unapologetically as yourself. First of all, and frankly, you're most comfortable when you are you. I don't have to figure out who I'm supposed to be. I don't have to think about what someone expects me to be like. I don't have to try to conform and say, this is how a person in this position would feel. Therefore, I'm going to be like that. I just come in as myself. And who I am includes the fact that I'm a woman, that I'm a mother, that I'm Black, that I grew up in the Midwest and in the, on the East Coast 
that I'm married to a black man, that I'm the daughter of black parents, that I am the granddaughter of those who were domestic employees in the North and the South, that I am living in a particular community, that I've gone to certain schools, that I've been pulled over, that I've been in the car when people have been pulled over. You know, that there have been assumptions made about me, that people who have looked like me and don't look like me have been both helpful and harmful. And all of those things combined mean that when you're at that seat at the table, you actually come and operate from within that universe as well. That, you know, you can't say to yourself, well, the law says this and um, that's, that's the way it always is. When you know full well, wait a second. I've been in the car and been in the passenger seat when a young black man has been driving and I've seen the way the officers have treated him. I've seen that person put their hands instinctively on the windshield long before it was a conversation about um, an officer involved shooting as we've come to know them in the last decade or more. You've seen that, you know what that feels like. You've seen yourself go to the polling place and you've watched perhaps many times, if you knew it or not, somebody who is struggling to figure out where they're supposed to be or has been turned away. When you've seen and watched what happens in, in Washington, D.C., and the powers that be, and in your own home states, and local jurisdictions as well, by the way, um, when the power that they say they will use on the campaign trail is absent entirely once they become an incumbent, you have to go through all of those experiences, you know, and, and bring that to the table. And so first you have to be unapologetic about acknowledging that what has happened and what happens could also happen again. The second thing is, you know, I believe wholeheartedly in Arthur Ashe's quote of, you know, was it do what you can use what you have, start where you are. It doesn't have to be these grandiose, entire, you know, legislatively gutting points and moments of advocacy to change the world. It can be something like, you know what? Um, I am hearing about an issue with bail reform. And there are many people where the defense counsel maybe is overwhelmed in being able to represent at certain times of the year in particular. Maybe I can be pro se or maybe not pro, pro bono, excuse me, in cases such as that. Maybe it's a matter of there's an amicus brief that I can use my appellate skills to write because I have more access, perhaps, and even the federal government does on an issue or an individual case, and I can be a friend of the court. Maybe it's a matter of um, if it's a, a code that needs to be changed, you're on a commission of some sorts to lend your own expertise and insight on a particular aspect of the law. And that things we can be doing as, as lawyers more broadly to have some real tangible involvement in the system. And, you know, because the laws are always going to be in some respects incumbent on the branch of government that actually writes them, we have to hold accountable those who are completely averse to ensuring that the law evolves with our standards, our beliefs, and the changing times to reflect what we mean when we say speaking truth to power. All those things are going to be so impactful. And at the end, if you find yourself, you know, if you find yourself looking at a ballot, um, looking at a commission, looking at a bench and wondering, you know, why is this person there? And why don't I have choices and people that I would actually want to um, elect or to decide on a case or to be the prosecutor or to be a on the commission or the council, whatever it is, then consider writing your own name down and stepping up to the plate and not being a spectator in democracy because the three branches of government will only work if we really fully participate. And certainly, Carlton, our justice system can only really be a just system if it actually reflects the people who are part of our communities. So we've talked a lot about process. We've talked a lot about people. We haven't talked that much, though, about you. So I, I do. There are a couple things that really stuck out to me while I was um, reading your book. One was your ability to make these assessments 
assessments of people. I mean, you, as a prosecutor, you must hear, I'm innocent. You must hear, you got the wrong person. You must hear those things so often. But you also had a certain curiosity as well. And I kind of um, contrast that with a colleague you talk about when you first went over to the U.S. Attorney's office. And he seemed to have a complete lack of curiosity. And, um, and so can you just talk about where does that come from and how that served you in your time uh, in the Justice Department? Well, thank you for that. Um, I am a very, I believe, a very observant person. Um, and I don't, although part of my career is talking, I don't actually relish and love the sound of my own voice. I much more like to learn from people and hear. And I study people a great deal. I like to study the way people move their mouths when they're trying to persuade you or, or deceive you. I look at the body language that people use. I think about where they're coming from and the things that they value through their actual actions and what they do and say. And I, I'm a voracious biography reader because I really, for some reason, I've always been very drawn. It might explain my affinity for the ratchet reality TV program, which we know is not <laughs> truly reality, but it's good escapism. Um, I like to observe people because I like to learn from a safe distance, the vicarious lessons. I hope not to repeat. And in doing so, um, one of the things I, my curiosity comes from is not only how I am mesmerized and enthralled by storytelling, but also out of fear of what happens if I got that wrong. Like, what if? The what if motivates me a lot, not because I'm a perfectionist, although I, I perhaps am, um, but the what if of, what if I'm wrong about you? I'm observing you. I like to see people. I like to see all those things. But what if I'm, I'm getting it wrong and the lens that I'm looking through is deceiving me and I don't actually know what's happening? And that really creates a, a, a bit of a, um, a level of open-mindedness that accepts the fact that as much as I value my intellect and my mind, I don't know everything. I haven't observed every person and I don't know you. So maybe you would surprise me. Maybe there's a chance I'm getting something right or wrong. And you have to have the open mind to know that. And it helps a lot in my curiosity about um, interviews, about depositions and private practice. It helped a lot in the courtroom, my open-ended questions, although not at trial. I knew the answers to the questions in, open, in a trial, right? We know that. Um, but in a grand jury setting or otherwise, or interviewing witnesses or, or talking to police officers, I really wanted to know the answer. I wanted to know what you had to say about it. I can evaluate and judge how I think you, what you mean about it, but you have to really have the intellectual curiosity and the humility to know that you don't know the answer to everyone's question or what they will say. And it goes back even in journalism now. I mean, in a way, although I've left the practice of law, it is mirrored in the practice of journalism where you're still asking questions with a genuine curiosity. I, I My personal approach is with a genuine curiosity, not looking to um, antagonize and let people know, look how smart I am. I can fact check and tell and call, tell you wrong on everything you've just said right now. And here's why I think you're, you know, you know, a fool on these areas. But instead, I've asked to interview you and people want to hear what you have to say. So explain your position. I can tell you why I think it's wrong, but I want to hear what you have to say. I'm not going to help you in your statement. I'm not going to hurt you in your statement because people have a right to hear and then judge for themselves as the electoral and consuming audience fact finder what they believe and why. And so I think that is fueled the, the through line for me throughout my life and, and in my career has been, well, well, I wonder what that means to them and what if, and I think I know, but why don't I just go ahead and ask you and huh, what do you have to say about that? And I listen and I hope people form their own opinions based on what they've said, not me leading a horse to the water and then dunking their head in it and, and confusing it with drinking. 
Well, Laura, we are unfortunately out of time. I have enjoyed this so much. And I you would, too. Thank uh, you. maybe we'll get around to at some point. Thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome. I'm so glad. And thank you again to the Ohio State Bar Foundation. It's really, I'm sorry we could not be in person, but what an exciting time to be in the law. And I hope that you all will continue whatever your personal pursuit of justice will be, because let me tell you what a world we would live in if we didn't just pursue justice, but one day we actually caught it. So thank you.